Well, thanks very much, Vienna. Right, so I'm, I'm assuming, I can't actually see it, but I'm assuming recording has started. <laughs> so yes. hi everyone, welcome for, thanks Tired. Um, welcome to the Open Ed Special Interest Group. Um, we're supported by ALT, uh, the Association for Learning Technology, and as you're probably aware, this is the run-up to the annual um, ALT conference. And we're just running a little pre-conference session. Um, a session actually, which I'm going to give her a shout out now, was inspired by Robin De Rosa, who tweeted a little while back and said, um, you know, how, how do people get started in open if they have no institutional support? You know, what, would, what should they do? If there is no funding, there is no institutional support. So that was the trigger for me to say, well, hang on a minute, there are loads. This is a really wonderful supportive community. So let's demonstrate that in this session today um, and share. So before we get started on all that sharing, we're going to just, uh, I'm just going to quickly um, note, and I know many of you are very familiar with Collaborate anyway, um, but to feel welcome in any space, you want to know where the controls are. <laughs> and many of us turned up here and we couldn't see a chat and we couldn't speak to each other. So that's all been put right. Thank you very much to the support of Alt there. Um, so if you want to communicate, you want to talk to each other, please do. That's what we're here for. Um, there's text chat. Feel free to grab the mic. I will uh, try and leave space for silence so you don't feel um, that you can't get a word in edgeways. Um, my name is Theresa McKinnon and I'm um, chair of the Open Ed SIG and uh, we've got Therese Bird here and we've got many great open practitioners joining us from literally all over the world at various times in various time zones. So a rich wealth of people connecting today. So this is our mission statement. This is what we're here for as a SIG. Um, you don't have to be a member of the Association for Learning Technology. Essentially, we are um, people who believe that education is too important to exclude. In other words, there are so many barriers that make it difficult for people to participate in education. What we try to do is to uh, push back on that and to make sure that we help people access great uh, learning opportunities and that those of us who work in education share our resources in order to help support everybody. And that's obviously become even more important thanks to the pandemic that we've all been through. So our aims really are to support um, practitioners, learners, anybody involved in education. Um, you've probably already seen our uh, COVID pledge for education that uh, uh, was masterminded not by the SIG itself, but is very much supported by the SIG. We're here to help people develop their ideas. We're here to get influencers to influence us and inspire us just as Robin did with her tweet. We want to see sustainable development in education. So ideas that are not just predicated on funding, which can be withdrawn at any point. Uh, and we're here particularly to influence policy. Uh, it's wonderful to see that the US yet again has um, a, again endorsed um, open publication of research these things really matter and they do make a difference and we certainly saw that in COVID. So it is important because, I, I, you know, none of us, after what we've been through in terms of the pandemic and also the climate crisis, could not be aware of just how important it is for us to work together to find solutions. And uh, by together, I mean across borders, uh, between countries, internationally, interculturally, um, and what we try to do is to make sure that we listen to each other and support each other and to reduce inequalities. And obviously that goal number four is particularly relevant uh, to us. Uh, here's just one example. This is from a, a webinar that was uh, done with Open Ed SIG uh, back in 2017, actually, with the Geo for All group. Um, just one of the major groups that contribute to 
sharing the importance of openness. Um, but in fact, it's very important for us to understand the challenges that face um, each other in our world at the moment. I'm sure many of you will have been well aware of the floods in Pakistan, the fires in the US, in California, the various um, huge climate challenges that are facing us all. Um, and you know, it really isn't, in, isn't good enough to just say, I'm OK, thank you. We all need to care about what is happening around the world and to work together. So to find out more about us, there is a link I'll share in the chat in a moment. But obviously, you can find us under that umbrella of the Association for Learning Technology, where they provided us with a really nice um, little community space and the use of um, Blackboard Collaborate to record our webinars and then make them openly available on uh, the Open Education channel of the Association for Learning Technology. Um, so today's session will be recorded. So please um, be aware of that. If you wish not to be recorded, um, then you might want to take that into account. Um, I'm going to stop my sharing now because I'm absolutely bursting to know who's here. Let's get into this room. Yay! <laughs> Therese, that's great. Lovely to see that smiling face. Great stuff. And to see our participants. Right. So I'm going to just share that link to our um, community space. So if you haven't found it already, um, our home page for our community space is coming into the chat right now. Uh, and that's where you can find us. And wonderful to see we have such amazing contributors to open education here with us today. The, this initial uh, tweet that came out from um, Robin uh, that sort of started this thought process going that we really need to help people, particularly those who are newbies and perhaps facing bigger challenges than ever in terms of getting going in open, perhaps because there's no funding, there's no time allocation. Many of us here have, have come through those sorts of challenges. And I'll point you particularly to um, people like Sheila and um, Lorna, Lorna, who I can see is here somewhere, uh, who have done great things despite the barriers. I think sometimes, you know, when we have those constraints, there, there's certain sort of people who say, I'm going to do it whatever <laughs> and you've got some of those wonderful people here in the room in front of you having to overcome huge barriers I, I, I Therese as well I know in your context with medical education openness presents all sorts of issues and problems that have to be unpacked and supported so essentially the idea was and I'm going to send an, put another link into the chat to start a little document here, a little Google Doc, which I'll put out, with links to resources that all those people facing those challenges have already had to either develop materials to support, or maybe blogged about, or essentially, in the case of Lorna, have pr produced the hu hugest website, and Alan as well, with his stories of openness, that can inspire and support and help others. So if you're in a position where perhaps you want to support your practitioners in continuing um, to be open or developing their open practice, if you're in a position where you yourself find that you have got very little um, in terms of support or knowledge in your institution, then the idea really here is to show you that there are plenty of people who faced those challenges before and who will I know because of their activity on social media, would be more than happy to help and uh, have lots of inspiration. So we've started it off. It is an open document. Anything you've got that you think, oh, yes, I really should put that in there. And I, again, I, I know in, in some cases, like Alan, we could take pages and pages of this document uh, with just the stuff that, <laughs> that has been produced. And it's the same in Edinburgh as well. Um, really. The aim is to make sure that people have a, a starting point. 
um, and that this can then be shared and captured. That's enough of me talking. I've done, I've done nearly 50 minutes. Wow, well, I'm going to shut up. So I'm going to pass the floor around and anybody who wishes to take the mic, you're more than welcome. Please give us an idea of your context and your take on this idea for a session and for resources. Um, and, I'm, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Yeah, go, Sheila. Okay. Hi, everyone. Well, I've not really got as much to share as, as other people that are in the room or, or out there, but I just thought I'd maybe share something with you all, um, which will be shared more openly next week. But uh, Helen Beatham and I have just done our landscape review around curriculum and learning design across the UK higher education sector. And I thought you might like to know that 64% um, of the respondents said that they shared their resources openly. So I thought that was a great, <laughs> a great um, example of, um, sorry, just switch my phone off, um, of open education practice and how people, particularly people in academic development and support uh, roles, uh, learning technologists, learning designers, are actually leading the way and exemplifying modelling open education practice and sharing how people can create um, activities um, and designs. So I just wanted to share that. That is great to hear. And actually, Helen Beethan's name, I'm glad you mentioned it because it, the name escaped me, but being my aged um, position these days, often names do. But Helen was very much responsible for the open pledge uh, for COVID. Uh, and the work that she did there. Um, have, it's, it's such a privilege actually to be in, an, in a, a room with so many people who take open so much to heart and who exemplify by their practice just what open means and live open. But we know as well that a lot of people face huge challenges in opening up their work, perhaps because they are vulnerable or they have family members who are vulnerable, perhaps because the nature of their work is difficult to put out there in the open sphere um, without uh, sort of repercussions or trolling. And, you know, we've all seen those stories and, and know just how unpleasant that can be. So I think I want to, you know, as well as hearing just how um, how much amazing stuff there is out there, I want to give people perhaps that safe space so that you surround yourself with others who know and who understand the challenges and who can help. Um, so Nona, I really want to hear from you. Please tell us. Hi, folks. Sorry, I'm, I'm multitasking here. I'm having lunch because I'm bouncing from meeting to meeting today. <laughs> no, I, I was just going to pick up on um, uh, what Sheila was saying, because funnily enough, we've actually at Edinburgh, we've just um, shared um, some of our learning design resources. So I've put a link in the chat there, and that are that's the resources, um, the Edinburgh Learning Design Roadmap. And these are resources that have been used in this institution to run two-day learning design workshops with uh, course leaders and curriculum leaders in order to enable them to work through the learning design of their courses. So this is an approach that builds on many other approaches that you already be familiar with, um, such as the viewpoints resources, the ABC approach from uh, UCL, um, some really old work the Open University did in this area. And this was an approach that was used um, here in the University of Edinburgh over the past kind of like, I think five years or so. Um, we've now actually moved on to using a slightly different approach. We're much more focused on um, uh, the ABC methodology, uh, but we thought it would still be useful to share these kind of legacy resources um, in case others wanted to use them. So yeah, so there's there's some free and open learning design resources. That's wonderful, Lorna. Thank you. I've just added it to the document. I hope that's okay. Um, 
I think, you know, it, it becomes, everything becomes so complex, doesn't it? Making that decision to go open can seem quite straightforward. And then actually having to deal with and cope and, and figure out how you manage licenses and whether, um, whether you can share openly, whether your institution politically wants you to do that. Um, it's, it's complex. So anything that helps people understand and navigate that is really helpful. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to Alan. I'm, I'm aware it's very early in the morning. Alan, sorry <laughs> to drop you into this. But are you are you willing to tell us a little bit perhaps of the, of the work that you've been doing? Sure. But I, oh, of course, Lorna just spoke. She had her hand up. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Um, I'm working now with Open Education Global, and uh, we're interested in, of course, many of the same things. And um, and I've always been a big fan and gotten so much out of the, the alt community. And uh, and so I would like to institute maybe some ideas of having um, special interest groups um, within, uh, within our work. And um, uh, great to see so many colleagues that I've known for uh, so many years. And uh, I think what you're doing here is, is almost more important than the resources. And that it's just finding um, your fellow peers out there. Um, and so um, often uh, people trying to break into this uh, feel alone and, and overwhelmed. And, um, and I, I personally think that, um, you know, everybody has to find their, their drive and, and um, reason for doing this. Um, it, sometimes it feels like, oh, I, sh I need to be doing open or I should be doing open. And um, people have to find that thing that's that I want to be open. And, um, you know, and for me, it's just because I honestly get so much more back in terms of um, everything I've learned to do and create has come um, from things that other people have done and, and modeled. And it just seems easy uh, to make that um, sort of like the way I think it's easy, the way we operate. And so, um, you know, obviously, you know, you know, we hear a lot, uh, especially in uh, coming from North America, where I'm located, open textbooks have been a thing, but everybody now is saying that's fine, but we realize we need open pedagogy and, and practices. And, um, and that's quite a bit broader. Um, and so I, you know, my, my personal favorites are projects where, um, you know, it's just speaking in a podcast with um, Lorna and um, uh, uh, for that we're going to produce soon and um, just finding out about the projects that students are doing um, in terms of creating OER themselves. Um, and Charlie Farley, with them. I'm just so fascinated by the geosciences outreach program that they're doing there in Edinburgh. And I mean, to me, those are the ones that have such impact for the students. Um, are actually um, doing more than just consuming OER. They're creating them themselves. And that's that's where my interest really is. That's brilliant. And, and create, you certainly do. And certainly the um, technologies that you've put in place that help us to do that are most welcome. Um, so we're quite a small um, SIG. We're a very small committee. Um, but hopefully what we can provide is a sort of um, connection between the various um, open uh, practice that is going on and I, I do appreciate as well that it is it is totally um, overwhelming to many people the, the word open is a is a very broad a very open word and you know one of the things that we really have to do is to help people find as you say their reason for open their practice and perhaps you know, explore a little bit at a time. So we have got some links on that document that help just to define the difference between open access, open textbooks, open pedagogy. And the next person I really need to bring in, and she's already been kicked out by Collaborate once, and <laughs> it very much connects to what we were just saying, is Catherine. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, I, I yes. somehow got knocked out, but I'm back again. <laughs> so we overcome everything here. Yeah. We, we still get there in the end. 
Oh, it's just so lovely to hear uh, all these voices and Alan and Lorna and Sheila and you both. Um, yeah, lovely to be here with you all. Um, when Alan speaks, I always often think that um, for so many years I've said, I don't think I've done one presentation without um, an open image from CogDog in it somewhere. So uh, your, your collection is vast and wonderful, Alan, of, of all that you share. So thank you. Um, I, th I'm, I think I might just mention uh, this morning I was finishing writing my final report for my GoGN fellowship. So I might just mention that because um, it was a, it was a slightly different direction than some of my other work. And what I chose to do was just partner with three community organizations in the area, you know, the general area where I live, um, just to kind of partner with them because I know I knew they're sharing knowledge and so often community organizations have so little support to a do what they do, but b perhaps to think about opening um, the knowledge that they share um, with their communities. So the project was just to partner with three organizations to really understand what their aims and challenges were and then explore ideas for um, sharing and the 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 reason for the pro or kind of the rationale for the project was that it wasn't leading with openness because you know this community of open practitioners more than many others really understands the importance of nuance and critical approaches and understanding social justice approaches so the project um, which i called just knowledge was guided by as i put it three ideals justice equity and openness so really deep discussions with the community partners to see what the knowledge was, you know, were there any risks of sharing it with particular audiences, you know, things about permissions and archiving and licensing and all of that. Um, and I really was led by the, the data feminism work, the, you know, the seven principles of data feminism, which I think, you know, are just so applicable to so much of our work and open, you know, the, the, what they are, you know, examine power, challenge power, elevate emotion and embodiment, rethink binaries, and hierarchies, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. So um, it's just been an absolute joy, and I've learned so much. And uh, you know, the, even though the fellowship has finished, I'm going to continue my relationships with these three groups: um, the Galway Traveler Movement, um, Green Sod Ireland, um, and um, a, a bird conservation group. So, you know, I, my aim was that I would work with marginalized communities, but they actually all are, have different community ideals in different ways. Um, so anyway, just wanted to share that and um, I'll be sharing, I'll be publishing my report on my blog, hopefully by the end of the week. Wow, that's wonderful. I think the last time we spoke, you were just embarking on that. So uh, it's great to have yeah. an update and to know it's gone so well. And I, isn't it so important as well that we as educators engage with education that comes in different forms so on um, you know groups that are working for as you say social justice they're working to support marginalized communities and we don't just yeah. think in terms of um, speaking between HEIs so exactly that's yes another great groundbreaking uh, project Catherine thank you so much for telling us about thanks that. Teresa and, and do feel free to share share the link once the report's um, published. It would be lovely to have it on that document. And Therese, go ahead. Um, so when when Ellen was speaking and mentioning about students, um, I can share something. Um, so I run a student group called Medrift, Medical Research into Future Technologies. And we're starting to create um, um, 3D printed items, which I often show the skull. <laughs> um, but what's really cool is to be able to make scans, and they're, they're 3D image scans, and to share them on the Sketchfab um, uh, site. So that's just sharing that. And um, now, just over the summer, our group joined together with another group called Med Race, and it's the, the students who um, you know are kind of working for racial justice in medicine and uh, every student has some kind of encounter with 
whether it be a patient who makes a racist comment and says, I don't want you to be my doctor or things like this. Um, and we actually have training for that to how to deal with that, how to deal with microaggressions, even macroaggressions. And so um, uh, active bystander training is the training that MedRace does. Well, this summer we joined together with MedRift and we created some uh, 360 degree videos where you can see the whole scenario and then you're there in that situation and you're hearing or you're experiencing or it's happening to you this microaggression and what would I do and how would I help my colleague who's standing next to me something like that so these are they're not really um, for prime time yet, but I went ahead and I'm just showing you it. This is our rough draft. And if you watch that on Chrome or on a um, on a handheld device with the YouTube app, you'll be able to scroll through and you'll get the 360 um, feeling of it. So I don't want to go through and try to launch it on here because it's kind of hard. But um, but there you go. So that just hot off the press. And I have to say the students are, they're the ones, you know, they, they're living it and they're feeling it. And so they, you know, they're the ones who wanted to get in there and they wrote the scripts, they got, they did everything. So um, that's where the energy is. <laughs> That's wonderful. And we so get your energy, Therese. That's brilliant. And the, the medical context is one of the trickiest. And, you know, I think it's, it, it's hugely challenging. So great to see the work that you're doing there as well with encouraging students to um, get involved and live the challenges. I, if I can just quickly recall listening to Robin DeRosa many, many years ago now, because I was sat in my office at work, uh, talking about students' experience of not being able to afford textbooks and, and just weeping as I listened to her account because it was so moving. And, it, you know, if anything, I think we've, we're feeling that even more now, that, that the, the cost of living, the price of actually doing whatever you want to do in terms of study means that people face huge challenges. So the work that you're all doing is just more important than ever. Um, Perhaps, perhaps you could just pass a link on there to Alan. Yes. Thank you, Therese. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Marvellous. Right. I know Francis is here with us. And if anybody is an expert in dealing with the various power struggles and, uh, and demands of being uh, at intersections, Francis is. And I'm so pleased to see, the Francis, that the... Um, Quilt is being shared at the Alt C conference. I'm sorry, I'm not physically going to be there, but it's lovely to hear that. Francis, are you able to join us on your mic, or would you like to? Yep. Ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> How are you? It's a long time since I've heard your voice. It's lovely to hear you. <laughs> I'm a bit croaky today. Hi. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to have to go in a little while. I'm not going to take long anyway. When I was watching you in start and you, the, the principles that you talked about, it struck me, and I've just put something in the chat, that there's a really interesting nexus, I think, between openness and sustainability, which is particularly relevant to all of us after the time we've been through over the last few years. I mean, it really brought it home to me during COVID, and I've always been interested in sustainability. and. It seems to me that the bit of openness that's sort of um, persuading, uh, not, nobody in this room, obviously, but persuading people to be open in order for others to profit or benefit from it is something to be really worried about. And um, that, so when we're encouraging people to be open, how do we deal with the issues that might damage the sustainability, that they might get overwrought, you know, past themselves, just end up giving away too and I don't mean giving away too much. I think it's more about your time and the point that um, Lorna made um, earlier about visibility of labor, I think is really important. But the other, the other part is something that we've all realized since 2020 is the importance of self-care. So really, and but if anybody's, 
I, I haven't got any resources, but I, if I find some, I'll share them. But if anybody had any resources on things like that, I think that would be also very useful. So I'll leave you to it now then. Well, that's, that's lovely. And as ever, it's a really important point that needs to be, to be made. I know, because I wrote a little bit myself on sustainability of um, education with a colleague in Australia, and our focus really was not just on empowering people to be open, but also on making sure that they um, reap the benefits of their openness themselves. You know, everybody benefits. Of, obviously, if you if you work in the open to an extent, that there's always the possibility that your impact will be greater than perhaps in your usual circle. But so important to balance this self care and wellness. And in some ways, when when people say, well, actually, you know, there's no institutional support, I think in some ways that's kind of a relief um, because then you're answerable only to yourself. You're not being whipped into doing things that you're not comfortable with. Lorna, please go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it was just to pick up on the, the point that um, Francis made about um, digital labour and the, the ethics of the open space. And it's it, it, something that's been a bit of a hobby horse for mine um, for a while is how can we sort of reconcile the, the labour that we put into the open space that is often invisible and unacknowledged and how you know we all contribute to the open community because we're, we're committed to it you know we we feel it's important we believe in it but at the same time we do have to be aware of of our labor and i think this is particularly an issue within the higher education sector and at the moment given the ongoing industrial dispute um, and it is very difficult to sort of encourage people to be open if they are already working under you know desperately precarious um, circumstances um, but regarding the um, the ethics of um, uh, openness as well Creative Commons actually had a working group in this area last year which was led by Josie Fraser who many of us will know um, I had some involvement in that as well and they actually produced um, or we produced a paper on the ethics of open sharing um, which uh, it's quite a short paper but it covers quite a lot of um, the more problematic aspects um, of sharing things openly. I'll, I'll dig out the link and I'll, um, I'll share it in the chat there. So I'll go do that for you now. Thank you, Lorna. That was, that's wonderful. And I, I think I did see some of that going through Twitter a while back. Um, and it's, it's just great to know that people are focusing on those sort of aspects um, because our labour is important and it needs to be acknowledged and I think we tried to do in a very small way really but we did try through the open ed sig to recognize some of the openness and the open work that's being done through um, issuing some open badges um, it, it's a it's a small token but it's sort of recognizing between ourselves within the community the work that we're all doing one of the most difficult things always about convening open ed sig meetings is everybody's so busy they're all so busy working and uh, you know it's 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 hard to ask um, people to do more when they're already working so hard. Um, Sheila, go ahead. Oh, just kind of following on from what, what Lorna was saying and what Francis raised, and this is probably a, a bit selfish and a bit naive, but um, I think one of the things about openness in communities like this is actually particularly in times like we're living through just now, which let's face it is pretty crap just now that actually just in this half an hour I've been smiling because I can see and I can hear people that I know and I think there's a bit of joy that we can get from open education and open educational practice and I know that I don't want to be all motherhood and apple pie about it but I think there is something about that that there is something positive about openness as well which I think is why people make time to come to things like this as well Teresa so it's how we kind of harness that and make sure that we can keep you know, keep supporting each other too. Thank you. Thanks so much for saying that. I think, I mean, it's all about the human at the end of the day, as, as Alan mentioned earlier, really, that the success of these communities comes down to the fact that um, that you are here and that we can talk to each other, we can see each other, uh, and somehow that helps to, to, helps us to keep going all the time. Um, Rich, I can see Rich is here with us, and 
I know you haven't put your hand up, Rich, but I, I want to make sure that you know that we've seen you. And if you would like to put your mic on and tell us, talk to us about something, something you're doing or something you resources that you need or whatever it is, please, please do. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, afternoon, everybody. I'm Rich Goodman from Loughborough University. Yeah, I'm one of these people who's kind of on the edges of this thing because it's a it's a personal passion, but it's definitely not an institutional passion. Um, so, yeah, it's a kind of I always just like to kind of keep myself involved and just kind of listen to stuff and you know, make sure I know the latest things that are going on and just try and keep up with various things happening in the community. But, yeah, it's just not something I have uh, any professional time for because there's just no time for it. And again, the last couple of years, that's wiped out any possible time that there ever was. So just being, you know, being able to do something small or creative or something like that. But um, yeah, so it's just a personal passion that I just like to keep involved with, uh, you know, hearing about what's been going on and keeping up with things really. So. Well, that's that's great. And thank you for saying that. And thank you for, for joining us today. Um, we will all certainly be looking out for you and making sure um, that we uh, acknowledge um, anything that you could find helpful. I mean, looking around the room, I know Lorna has been very successful in actually establishing institutional policy directions that support um, that support openness. If that is a, a hill you wish to climb, but I'm not suggesting it's not a great way to get well and to be strong and fit. <laughs> it uh, doesn't quite do the cardiovascular stuff that you'd like, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, I stick, I stick with the physical hills at the minute. <laughs> but you're very, very welcome, and thank you. And I, yes, and I see you're involved as well with supporting um, Lorna on the social media coverage too. So thank you for that. We hope you'll uh, you'll get behind tweeting this session today and uh, make people aware of the OER SIG. We we are always, as always, looking for more. Um, committee members and we're also looking for more members in general so we have a just mail list you'll find all the details on the um on the community website so yeah please do feel free to connect and join with us there and uh yeah you're very welcome and should anybody mention to you that they'd really like to get involved in open <laughs> please send them our way <laughs> Once I pick myself up the floor, off of the floor, then I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> that would be brilliant. So I'm, I'm not going to, um, I'm just looking around for hands up and things. I'm not going to prolong our session beyond everybody having a chance to speak. I'm so grateful to you all for coming. And I'm so grateful too that it's put a smile on your face, Sheila because I know that will influence the next wonderful creative piece of work that you're going to come come out with too. So I look out for that on Instagram. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for being such wonderful open folk. And yes, by all means, do pop more in the chat and I'll make sure things are transferred onto, onto our document as well. And yeah, have a great time. Those of you who are going to Manchester, look out for my, um, my little buttons that are sewn onto it. My my one and only ever attempt to sew is captured on the FemEd Tech quilt. <laughs> so, yeah, please do have a great time and, and do tweet about it or let us know through social media so that we can all feel that we're part of that. And, and I'm sure there'll be great keynotes and great um, presentations going on. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate your time. <laughs>